everybody. Um, let's start. This clock is 10 minutes fast, so if you, uh, it is actually only 12.30 and a couple of people might trickle in. So uh, welcome. How fantastic uh, that we are all gathered here today. My name's Louise Denoon and I'm the Executive Manager of Heritage Collections. Um, and I get to welcome you. We present these with um, the Department of, with DERM, Resource Management, the Heritage Branch there, and it's a monthly series that we do. Um, I'd like to um, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're on, the Turrbal and the Yagara. Um, I think particularly in the context of this talk, it's important to acknowledge um, the traditional owners, but, but we always do as well. So today, Can everyone else hear that, or is it <laughs> <laughs> a whistle? <laughs> Shall I just keep? <laughs> so it will. That's all right. Okay. <laughs> it adds to the atmosphere. Yeah, I don't have to run up the stairs. <laughs> Um, I suppose when we were looking at the annual program um, for this year and thinking about um, having just been through uh, both the floods here in South East Queensland and Cyclone Yazi um, and knowing that these were new benchmarks, new milestones in Queensland's history, it was uh, an opportune time for us to invite Ian Townsend um, to come and talk to us about um, his research and his uh, writing about Cyclone Mahina. So um, I've actually just stepped out of a session in Auditorium One looking at digital preservation and the very big issues that we face with digital preservation and the um, National Library of New Zealand, the um, librarian there, uh, was just talking about the response to the earthquakes in Christchurch and the 8,000 quakes that were actually there and how to collect that, um, you know, for future generations. And I think that is, um, hopefully today, in thinking and learning about this, um, about Cyclone Mahina, we can also reflect on what we can learn from the past and actually what were the previous events that had happened here, that it wasn't just because it was the most recent didn't mean it was the biggest or the worst natural disaster um, that we'd ever faced without taking away, having lived through, I think, uh, well, certainly for me, the floods. It certainly gave me new insights now when I look at the collection and look at material and go, well, that would have really been horrific. I know what that mud smells like now and what it looks like. So, um, so, yeah, so for those of you who don't know, Ian's a journalist with ABC Radio National, so his voice will be familiar to us, um, and with background be briefing, produced radio documentaries for background briefing. He's won a number of um, three Eureka Science Prizes and a Human Rights Award um, and written two novels. Um, importantly for us, as we're in State Library and with the John Oxley Library, who was the John Oxley Library Fellow, um, uh, which was fantastic to have him here um, and part of the library at that time. So please welcome Ian Townsend. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks very much. Yes. Um, um, yeah, the John Oxley Fellowship actually helped a great deal with the research for this book and, and it's amazing really what you can find when you have a good look, thorough look through um, the historical archives uh, anywhere, but especially here. And I found some you know, um, unique and uh, previously unknown accounts of this particular storm and I thought that most of them had come up over the years. But, but uh, it, was, it was a tremendous... Um, tremendous discoveries that I made here that helped me write the book, which is called The Devil's Eye, based on the research that I did for Mahina, and I'm hoping to do so, a non-fiction book um, and, uh, and probably some um, uh, study as well at a university uh, thesis towards um, describing a bit better or a bit more uh, in detail the, the, this particular storm, because it's an amazing storm and, and we've been... We're very familiar with Yasi. It was only earlier this year, and that was a tremendous um, cyclone. Mahina was was significant and probably much more intense, or definitely more intense. Um, I'm a journalist. I'm, I'm not a scientist or a, a meteorologist or even an historian. Um, <clears throat> but as I said, I did a lot of research on Mahina, um, and uh, and I'm still you know researching it, even though I've written the novel. I'm still quite fascinated with the uh, 
the, this whole event because it involves such interesting you know, historical characters and an amazing uh, piece of Queensland history that still nobody really has, uh, has, has done um, any, any uh, official research on as a complete event. Um, I do radio documentaries and earlier this year when Yasi was coming towards the coast it looked remarkably like Mahina mustard coming out of the Coral Sea um, and it was heading towards Cairns as we know and it looked really bad. It was Category 5. I thought this is going to be another Mahina. I hope not. And then it, it, uh, it, it you know, came towards Cairns as we know and it slipped a bit further south. My far, my, most of my family or many members of my family are up in Townsville and I went across to the uh, Cyclone Warning Centre in Brisbane to see, see it come in. It was part of a documentary I was doing on, on how we handle disasters. And, and around midnight you could see the, the, uh, the eye as it came down uh, the coast and it crossed Dunk Island and towards Mission Beach. Um, and by then I knew it wasn't quite as intense but it was a, it was a uh, scary sight and, and in some way I, was, I felt very um, uh, unattached to what was happening because I was in front of computers and, and watching all of this and the, and the meteorologists were very uh, you know, scientific so they weren't overly emotional but you could see this terrible event unfolding and I, I thought the worst but luckily um, there were no direct fatalities involving this storm which was amazing. Um, so Yasi started out as, as, as taking a similar course probably to, to Mahina which hit the North Queensland coast in 1899 um, now, I'll just, hang on, I'll get used to this a bit. So that's, that's not Yasi, that's um, Monica. <laughs> but it's, a, it's again, it's a, a very similar. A lot of these storms look exactly like that and that's how uh, Mahina would have looked as it approached uh, Cape York. And you can see, you know, it, it, um, Monica actually, I think, went across this way. Mahina would have come down and that's... Uh, Princess Charlotte Bay there, Bathurst Bay, Cape Melville. And this is where my story and research is centred and this is where that uh, tremendous cyclone hit the pearling fleets back in 1899. just want to... I'll, I'll probably bore you a little bit first before I go into the story, if you don't mind, because I've, there's been some really interesting research by a student up at James Cook University and she's recently had her thesis accepted and she's, um, and, and, uh, she's got honours for it, but it's... Um, it's an amazing reconstruction of the storm surge um, at Bathurst Bay. The interesting thing about this particular storm is that it has the world record. This is Mahina in 1899, the world record for a storm surge, the, the big wave that comes in with the wind and pushes up against the shore and rushes ashore and, and, and in many hurricanes, cyclones, typhoon kills most people when these storms hit land. And the record for this storm surge was 40 feet, uh, about 13 metres. And that still stands as a record, but it was, that record was a second-hand account and people were a bit dubious about whether that was true or not because the records also said that this particular storm, and we talk about the intensity of storms, um, this particular storm, Mahina, had a central pressure of 27 inches of mercury, which is a description of the, the central pressure, which is, I think, about 914 Hectopascals, which is a very, very intense storm, certainly Category 5, if that was the case. But in my research, I discovered that when, when, when the Bureau of Meteorology looks at these storms, they try to guess the central pressure and, and, and they use satellites and computers now to see what the central pressure is. Unless that particular, the eye of that storm runs over a barometer, it's very difficult to get an accurate reading. Um, with Mahina, the eye of the storm passed over a barometer on a ship and that was recorded. And the ship recorded the central pressure of Mahina back in 1899 not as 27 inches but as 26 inches. It's just that nobody believed, the captain of the ship, that the barometer could fall so low. And that's 880 hectopascals. And that's, that's uh, you know, the, this is probably inaccurate, but it's the equivalent of a... Of a um, uh, a magnitude uh, 7 earthquake compared with a magnitude, say, 9. It's, a, it's an enormous difference in energy that these storms are producing. The difference between 27 inches and 26 inches is phenomenal. Very few 
uh, cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons around the world have dropped so low, although a few have, and, and there's this, I think there was a super typhoon in the northern hemisphere called Tip that uh, recorded a much lower central pressure, but it never came ashore. So um, this uh, student, uh, Camilla Green, in, in, in uh, Cairns, was interested in having a look at the storm surge recorded because 40 feet didn't match 27 inches. So the pressure of, this, of Mahina was 27 inches. It was very low, but it could not have produced a storm surge of 40 feet. That's 13 metres. You can imagine a 13-metre storm surge coming in anywhere along the coast. It would wipe out a city. So there was a lot of doubt about that, but looking at the records and the original reports suggested that it was actually 26 inches, not 27 inches, and she ran computer models and discovered that, yes, Mahina could certainly produce, and in fact, a 26-inch central pressure would produce a storm surge in that area of 40 feet. And that's significant to coastal communities along the coast. So this is interesting because we can look back into history and you know, do the research, re-examine these old events and this cyclone, and that has implications for today because we saw Yasi come in um, and uh, it was bad and it produced a storm surge, but the fact that the Coral Sea can produce a cyclone as intense as Mahina um, has grave implications for communities along the coast and it probably should be looked at a little bit more. Um, I'm not sure whether this research is widely known yet, but it's, um, it's really significant, I think. Well, and, and I'm interested, obviously, because I studied this storm. Um, this, this was the original... Um, uh, well, this is the interpretation that the Weather Bureau at the time gave to Cyclone Mahina. They believed that two cyclones actually combined and struck the North Queensland coast at Cape Melville. I'll tell you a bit about the, the actual story of the storm a bit later, but I'll just describe the, the thoughts at the time. Two cyclones hit the Pearling fleet, um, killed more than two, 300 people. Um, the guy who, uh, who predicted these storms was a, a meteorologist that was employed by the Queensland government called Clement Rag, and you might have heard of Clement Rag if you're in the story. He was also known as Inclement Rag or Wet Rag. And he was a, a real character of the day. He was a, a sort of the, 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 one of the celebrities of Queensland in 1899. Really interesting bloke. In many ways, you know. Deserves a book written about him. And he collected... Um, he tried to predict cyclones. He was employed by the government to predict cyclones. Basically, they employed... The Queensland government got him from Adelaide. They wanted to try to stop... Um, the, the terrible carnage that was done to shipping up and down the Queensland coast in those days. That was the main um, you know, transport of the time and, uh, and the cyclones and storms played havoc with the shipping. So RAG was employed and he, he did a pretty good job. He set up um, uh, telegraph, all the telegraph stations around the Coral Sea that he could find. He got the postmasters to send in their barometer readings on a daily basis and he managed to draw weather maps as you see today. Very similar in 1899 and the Telegraph was sending them in from Numea and up and down the Queensland coast. And he was able to um, draw a weather map and, and, and predict from the pressures where a cyclone might be brewing. And he actually predicted um, Mahina a few days before. He, he called it another, another name. Rag was famous. He was the famous man famous for actually um, starting to name cyclones. And, and he originally started to name them after letters of the Greek alphabet, you know, alpha, beta. But he ran out of number, uh, letters. And so then he turned to, um, to uh, uh, South Pacific maidens. Um, and Mahina was a South Pacific maiden's name. And I think he read it in, in the books of... Um, oh, I was a popular writer at the time. I just can't remember his name. But he wrote these wonderful tales of the South Pacific and included all these wonderful... Um, names of all the women there and, and Rag I think was a fan of his and he, when you read his books you can see oh, Rag got the name from there. So Mahina was one of the names <clears throat> and Rag had a very flowery way of writing. So his weather report a couple of two days before the cyclone um, read like this. This is a weather report. Like the hideous sword of Damocles involving fear, apprehension and soul-stirring misgivings 
does the tropical disturbance Taru hang off the northern portion of New Caledonia, the extreme southern side almost touching German. But the centre is about 300 miles north from that place, and we expect in due course to hear that a hurricane has swept the region between uh, New Caledonia and New Hebrides and the Solomons and the Louisiades. Still, however, do we distinctly affirm that the Queensland coast is no, not yet in danger. So he's saying there that there's a, there's a cyclone somewhere up there. He can see it from the, from his, the maps that he's drawn. He can't tell exactly where. Um, and, uh, but it's too far away at the moment to be a problem. This was two days before the cyclone, which is a pretty good, you know, <laughs> in those days, a pretty good prediction. And on March the 4th, he, uh, which was the day really the cyclone hit, he renamed it Mahina. Um, the new tropical disturbance, which we have named Mahina, is about 350 miles southeast of Sudest. Uh, and it goes on, blah, blah, blah. Now, Mahina is a girl's name, coal from fair Tahiti, with its coral strand, waving palm groves and mountain peaks, the loveliest of all the lovely islands in the wide Pacific. And mothers will agree that no infant daughter can bear a softer or prettier name. And this was the day the cyclone hit, and he was... When they found out... Uh, ten days later, or I can't remember, about, I think it might have been eight days later, that the terrible storm, the carnage that it wreaked, you know, Rag was ridiculed for these um, you know, lofty descriptions. <clears throat> but he, he, was, he was pretty well on the ball. You know, if, if they had wireless in those days, they would have been able to alert the shipping. But, of course, the shipping up there was, uh, was on its own by that stage. So he did a pretty good job, I think. Whoops. There's, um, this is the area we're talking about. This is um, Princess Charlotte Bay down here, and there's Bathurst Bay here, um, Flinders Islands, Cape Melville, and there's a, um, an area here called Ninian Bay and Bowen Bay. Um, and all this area, the cyclone probably came from this direction, went straight over the top of them. The pearling fleets had come down from... Thursday Islands, only a couple of days beforehand. Um, they'd waited really until the end of the wet season and the cyclones had all gone away. Well, they weren't really particularly worried about the cyclones because the Admiralty charts said there would, no cyclones had ever hit this area. What they were worried about was the, the quality of the water because they were sending men over the side to die for pearl shell and um, during the monsoon it was just too murky. So they waited till afterwards and they could um, set their sails with the northerly winds coming down. They came down here and they, there was about 1,000, uh, 2,000 people um, in, in uh, well, at least 100 vessels. I've got the names of 102 vessels, I think, in this area. And there's, but there would have been many more illegal vessels all around here. So there would have been a huge number of sails all around this area here, down to the Lizard Islands all looking for pearl shell, which was the, one of the luxury items of the time, and that was their, um, their big uh, industry. This is um, one of the interpretations of where the cyclone came from. I'll just show you that. To give you an idea of the reef and the Bathurst Bay and Barrow Point again, and the, one of the, the original tracks of Mahina. Um, so as I said, it's mo most notable for producing the world record storm surge of 40 feet and, um, and Carmilla Green's taken a closer look at the evidence and, f and found really that at 26 inches is probably more accurate a description of what um, the, uh, the captain of the ship that had the barometer on board, this is more likely to be what he recorded than 27 inches, which is a significant difference in... Um, in pressure. So before I get to the story, I'm sorry about this, but I just want to show you this is, um, is Carmilla's look at the storm surge of Yasi. And what she essentially did after Yasi, she went up there and looked at where the shell and the sand had been piled up because it was a storm surge of just over five metres, I think, south of where Yasi came ashore. So a five metre storm surge came in with Yasi. The sand was piled up and then you could see the debris sort of going up the slope towards the houses and through the houses. So she worked out, you know, where the... where, Oops. 
where the um, where the shell was, where the debris was, and that's the sort of the area where the storm surge or the inundation came to. Now she compared that with what she found at uh, Ninian Bay and Barrow Point, and it, it compared and, and looked and, and uh, she recreated with computer models um, Mahina. And uh, it suggests that Mahina was indeed around about 880 hectopascals and that the storm surge did rise to 13 metres. And as I say, that's, that's a significant... Uh, we talk about one in 100-year cyclones and we don't think of Mahina because it's not recorded officially as being that strong or that intense. But we really, I think, that the Coral Sea can produce a, a super cyclone that strong is significant and it needs an, another good look because you wouldn't want anything like that to hit Cairns and not be prepared. If we think the strongest cyclone to hit Cairns is 27 inches of um, 915 hectopascals, well, you have to actually rethink things if the cyclones can get down to 880 hectopascals and come ashore. So that's all new and interesting, I think. So, yeah, just there's, um, there's Mahina. 880 hectopascals, probably. Officially 914. Big cyclones in 1918. We've, we've got, so we're, you know, we're talking about southern oscillation indexes and um, La Nina's. Um, well, a lot of these big storms happened when there was a La Nina and... Um, the SOI was quite high. So you've got 1918, two big cyclones came ashore. Cyclone Tracy was 950, so I imagine Cyclone Tracy 950, Larry was 959, Yasi was 930, and Mahina 880, potentially. So back to the story, really. So in the, in the context of this huge storm, okay, you've got the pooling fleets um, coming down from Thursday Island, and they were owned by businessmen, um, the Clark family, um, Outridges, Munros, they, they, all these um, businessmen, most of them were based in Brisbane and they had schooners um, and the business was collecting pearl shell from the bottom of the ocean. They had all their schooners, all their uh, you know, factory ships up at Thursday Island and each schooner had about 16 luggers attached to it. And at the end of February, they all came down the coast to look for pearl shell because they thought it was you know, the best time to, to come down and it was reasonably safe. And you can imagine just before they came down, you know, Thursday Island was a bustling place. Then I think there were 1,600 people onshore and as many men, 1,600 men offshore in all the boats. And these guys um, were imported labourers. They came from about 26 countries around the world, so most of the fleet was made up of people from um, Southeast Asia, Japan, um, the Americas, uh, the people from South America there, there were African Americans, there were Indians, um, you know, from 26 different countries, all these young guys trying to make some money by joining the Pearl Fleets. So they were, they were aboard the luggers and all these people, you know, more than a thousand. And there were men, there were women and children with them too as they came down the coast. Um, and they're after pearl shell or mother of pearl. And they're the big shells um, that were really luxury items, you know, harvested from the sea floor. And this was right at the end, really, of the, was for, for several decades. Um, there was a, a great activity uh, across the north of these boats going backwards and forwards from Broome. You think of Broome being the capital of the pearling industry, but really the pearling industry moved Broome, Darwin, Thursday Island, depending on the technology of the time, how much further out they were or deeper they could go and where the pearl beds were. And at this time there was a huge fleet on Thursday Island. So there are 108 vessels I have a list of. And they're the pearling vessels there, the, they're the luggers. 
would have been a very attractive, quite a romantic sort of period. Um, it was a really... It was, these were mostly blokes, and they were young blokes in their 20s and 30s, and it was really a boy's adventure. They drank heavily, you know. They sang songs. They had a, they had a rip-roaring time. Um, the description of the pearling fleets when they were right at the end of their two-week stint and the pearl shell had all been loaded along, you know, onto the luggers and they had a day off. Um, you know, the alcohol was dispersed and everybody took up their instruments and there was, you know, you can imagine uh, close to a 1,000 people in these bays, um, all the yahooing and, uh, and music there was. It was quite a cacophony. So they were all anchored. What happened was they got down there and, they, and they'd, they'd been out for a couple of weeks and they'd, um, they'd got their shell, they brought it back. It was a Saturday. They unloaded the shell and they're going to have Sunday off. So Saturday night was the time for a party. So Saturday night in the afternoon, you know, they were all starting to drink and, and start to play their zephyrs and, you know, accordions and mouth organs. They were all very musical lot. And... Um, off in the distance, this big storm was coming down. This cyclone had been seen two days earlier on, from Thursday Island, about 600 miles away. People on Thursday Island described the sky being lit up from horizon to horizon with lightning, and they couldn't hear a thing. And was the lightning from this storm was bouncing off the stratosphere and being reflected down. So they knew there was a big storm out there. It looked like it was far away, and they didn't know where it was. But it startled people on Thursday Island. They'd never seen anything like that before. So this storm was a spinning ball of energy coming across the, the coral sea and it had a tremendous amount of electrical activity with it. The, um, the people on the, the boats, especially the skippers, would have known that something was going to happen because the barometer would have been dropping. It would have um, probably not gone up during the day, it probably would have fallen and they would have known then that there was a big storm. Not much they could have done, they wouldn't have known exactly where it was and they felt they were sheltered because... Oops. Around here, big big hills behind here, Cape Melville, big black, big hills of black granite stone, sheltered from the southeast. It was a great place, really, for diving and for, for fleets, because the southeasterlies would they'd be protected here. So they all, as the, the afternoon progressed, they all started to come a bit closer towards the coast. They knew there was a storm. The wind wasn't that strong at the time, even in the late afternoon. As with cyclones, it comes in gusts and there's you know, literally the calm before the storm. So you think of a big cyclone out here. It gets windy out this way, but closer to it, it just comes in gusts and there's these lulls and it can be very quiet and eerie. And that's what they described. The rain would have started as you know, a drizzle. And this is basically where the the boats are anchored and where many of them sank. But I'll, I'll just go a bit further on here. This guy is um, John Martin Kenny. He's the police constable from the 8 Mile um, Native Police Station. And he wasn't... A, you know, he, wasn't a, he, was a, he was a native policeman. He wasn't a, a member of the police force. So he was a, a member of the native police, which involved really an officer and several trackers. And they were a paramilitary force for many decades and were involved really in many of the dispersals around the country. But by 1899, they were a bit more benign and they were under the control of the protector of Aboriginals. And this is um, John Martin Kenny, who was the police officer, the, the officer in charge of the trackers. What, a few days uh, before the end of February, a bloke was brought into a hospital at Cooktown with a spear wound and it had gone, there's a fantastic description I found in the hospital records. And, uh, you know, the hospital records normally are pretty bland. You know, they'll describe a wound or an injury, but they won't describe how it happened. This description of the spear wound um, and how it occurred is quite dramatic. But it, it went through his arm and into his side. And for this happened about two weeks beforehand, and he'd managed to come down to one of the gold diggings, and he was taken then... Um, down to Cooktown, I think by boat, into the hospital with his spear wound. But he said his mate had been killed in this attack. So Kenny's job really was to respond to anything like that. So Kenny, um, after interviewing the, the man in hospital, 
uh, was really obliged to go up north and find out what happened and bring the perpetrators to justice. And it happened... Uh, the, the guy was a pearler. He was from the Pearl Fleets. He'd come ashore and was speared and his mate was killed. This is what he said. And it all happened at Cape Melville. So Kenny started going north. By the time he got to Cape Melville, he just happened to arrive just at the time when the cyclone was about to hit. So he was a bit unlucky. Mm-hmm. Although lucky for us that he was there, really, because it makes a good story, yeah. doesn't it? You know, mm-hmm. It's a murder mystery as well as you know, a terrible disaster. <laughs> So that's Kenny, he's a young guy, you know, too. There's all young blokes involved in this. There weren't that many women up there. Ooh, that's a good question. I think that's just a mark on the photo. Or, yeah, it could be. Right. Um, a lot of the cops were pretty corrupt in those days. <laughs> so it might well be some sort of payoff. That's his patrol area. So Kenny and his, um, I think he had four trackers, had all the Cape York to... Oh, no, sorry, that's not Kenny's, that's... Um, it's the Cohen Patrol. This is Kenny's here. So Kenny was based, uh, Cooktown's here, he's based at the 8 Mile, and that's his patrol area. So anything that happened here, and this is where the alleged um, <laughs> spearing happened up here. So he had jumped on his horses with his trackers, went hightailing up here along the coast, you know, got to here, storms coming down, pearling fleets all in here, and, uh, you know, disasters waiting to happen. Yeah. Bit too hard for me to. Where about here? No, on the right, on the coast. On the coast, Boom Perth. <laughs> Somewhere around here. Anyway, so we've got Cooktown here. There's Cooktown. Yep. Right. So yeah, Kenny was on his way up north. And there he is setting off. That's actually the Eight Mile Police Camp. And uh, not sure what year that is. <laughs> it may well be Kenny. You can see uh, it would have been after the cyclone if it was Kenny because he's married here with kids, <laughs> presumably. But they're the trackers. Just here, and the officer. Another officer there. That's again another look at the the um, native police. There's the officer, a little bit casual, in the trackers, and they've got you know, the obviously posed photograph, bringing in some people. Probably didn't do much. Now, so while Kenny's up there and he's just arrived at the coast, you know, he's looking. For, he's spent the day you know, trying to get tracks to find out where this guy had been killed. But the, the weather beat him, so he's, he's climbed up to the top of this um, dune with his trackers because the wind's starting to get up. It's late afternoon on the Saturday. Across the other side of the Cape is the Pearling Fleet, and they're taking shelter as well. And, um, you know, everything's looking pretty ominous. There's rumbling in the background as these big storms coming in. Um, this is um, William Field Porter, who's the captain of the, but the schooner Crest of the Wave. He's a Kiwi. His father was a famous Kiwi, one of the first members of Parliament in New Zealand. and um, He's uh, in Bathurst Bay with his wife and child and his schooner with uh, maybe 26 uh, men on board. But his wife and child are there as well. He brought his wife and child along. Um, and so he's a bit more worried because he's got his family on board. So he's anchoring his schooner close to the uh, close to the Cape, hoping to protect them. And you know, by seven, eight o'clock at night, the wind's coming up, and you can, it's coming down, it's coming over the top of the Cape in huge gusts. You know, so it's flattening the boats. Everybody's taken in their sails. Um, many of the vessels put out two anchors so they wouldn't drift. So they know something's up and they're just hoping that the whatever it is, they suspect it would be a cyclone, of course. But it's got the constant lightning by that stage. Constant lightning, you know, out to sea as this big storm rolls in. And uh, around about midnight it all starts to get really bad. You know, some of the... Most of the vessels anchored in um, Bathurst Bay survived the first half of the cyclone. Um, only, but I'll tell you about that later. There was a light ship anchored in the channel, um, the... 
uh, and it was anchored uh, with um, uh, moorings at the bottom of the sea and it had nowhere to go and it sank pretty quickly. It was overwhelmed. There were four guys on the light ship and they all drowned. So on the schooner crest the wave, William Field Porter's there. His wife and child are below and he's popping down occasionally to see how they're going. It's so bad that um, Maggie Porter, with her baby in her arms, has to stand for the whole night because the rocking's so bad. If she sat down or tried to lie on the bed, she'd be thrown around. So she tried to ride it like a surfboard and she stood there you know, violently ill baby hardly able to talk in the bowels of the ship while um, her husband was on deck trying to save them all. And, you can, and the, the, the wind just kept getting up and up and it, the cyclone, either cyclone didn't hit until just about dawn, although there was no dawn on that day, about four or five in the morning. And, uh, and you know, uh, I, said, I mentioned 880 hectopascals. This is one of the biggest storms to hit anywhere in the world. So... Um, it would have been uh, horrific. And the roar and the noise of it, if you've ever been in a cyclone, terrifying. That's the crest of the wave. Um, it's, this comes from the, um, the Porter family in New Zealand. They found this photo, this uh, painting, which is a pretty accurate drawing of the crest of the wave after the cyclone's eye passed over. Because what happened after the eye passed over, um, well, it might have been before. It looks like the mast has snapped off. No, I think they've chopped down the front mast. The mast that was still up, Porter went out and chopped it down because the wind was so strong that anything that was standing was really acting as a sail. And they were being swept out to sea. <coughs> now, I'll just sort of jump a bit to the, the end. But so the, the, the cyclones come in. The eye comes through, and the eye's overhead in, in Bathurst Bay, and everybody thinks, oh, you know, thank God it's over. But, of course, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the young blokes had never experienced a cyclone before. The eye of the cyclone was there. Porter had come down just before the eye had passed over and read his barometer and, and took, took it down as 26 inches, saw that his wife and child were OK. The eye comes over. He knew what was happening, that it was going to come from the other way. He'd thrown out one anchor, and during the night, the, the crest of the wave had been swept by the wind up out to sea. All the other boats were really well anchored in Bathurst Bay and they didn't move much. So the crest of the wave was way away now from Bathurst Bay. They just passed the light ship which had sunk and then the wind came from the other direction um, with you know, greater ferocity. So he ch chopped down the masts. Um, uh, the ship sprung a leak. Uh, they were going down and he went down to actually say goodbye to his wife and child and kissed his baby and said, you know, um, you know kissed Dad a goodbye. This is what he said. <laughs> Terrifying. But the boat survived. It was the only vessel in, that was in Bathurst Bay to survive because what happened, the other vessels were so well anchored, the technology was so good, their ground tackle was so up-to-date and new that it held them fast in Bathurst Bay. When the wind changed, so they were underneath the, lead, the cape, when the wind changed, they faced a de what's called a dead lee shore. So they faced a lee shore and it was a dead lee shore because they couldn't get out and they were all swept ashore. And, um, and that's where most of the fatalities occurred. I think there were uh, 26 vessels in Bathurst Bay and they all went down. The log of the crest of the wave was repeated in the the um, the outreach. There was one of the, uh, the one of the owners of one of the fleets was um, uh, Percival Pittman Outreach, who was a publisher in Brisbane, and he so many people had died. He published a memorial book, and he um, he got uh, Porter to um, to uh, give him the, the log of the crest of the wave. But this isn't the log. It doesn't read like a log. And it wasn't, in fact, what Porter <coughs> said. So the barometer went down to 26 inches, he told his father in a letter. And uh, Captain Craig, when he interviewed Porter the day after, there some of the steamers were coming through and picking up survivors and the dead. And Craig said that he had doubts as to whether the crest of the wave could really have experienced a cyclone as low as 26 inches because he'd never seen... The worst typhoons he'd have experienced were 
you know, four to twenty-seven point three. So Porter's twenty-six inches was in doubt, and and Percival Pittman Outridge changed it from twenty-seven to from twenty-six to twenty-seven, rounded it up. Uh, over three hundred, probably more. Three hundred officially. I've got. The, um, it was always thought. Well, here's the, the memorial at, at Bathurst Bay to the dead. So there's twelve white men died, and they're on the memorial. And at the bottom it says over three hundred coloured men drowned. It was always thought that those names had never been known, but in fact I've found records from several sources, and I've got, I've got about two hundred and eighty odd names now, cross referencing them. There's some of them there. You can see where they come from, these young guys, and you know, their ages. Uh, Malay, Malacca, Java, Singapore, Aborigine, England, well, so Japan, a lot from Japan, and the islands in the South Pacific. But, uh, but these are the official, there was a lot of illegal fishing up there at the time. These are the guys who are registered. So births, deaths and marriages actually had a list. Um, when I was looking for trying to find the list of the dead, I found a few sources from the Maritime uh, Department. But when I looked at the... You can, you can look on, in the library of the um, births, deaths and marriages and you, see, you can see the deaths from day to day back in history. It won't tell you who they are, but you can see the deaths until you actually order the certificates. Um, you can see the deaths and, you know, like uh, March the 2nd, 26 deaths in Queensland. March the 3rd, you know, 20 deaths in Queensland. March the 4th, 150 deaths in Queensland. March the 5th, you know, another 120. So that time of the cyclone. Um, you could see that there were death certificates issued for a lot of these guys. But when you look at the death certificates, they don't really tell you much. Just a name. It's a, often a wild guess. So I actually had to cross-reference a lot of the names and... But it does give you a lot of clues as to who these people were. It was reported, it was the height of the white Australia, not the white Australia policy, it wasn't a policy then, but it was a debate about whether we should have a white Australia. And of course all the unions didn't want um, uh, foreign labourers um, coming and taking jobs. They perceived that a lot of these guys from around the world were taking you know, white men jobs, so they were... Um, they, they wanted a white Australia. But the Pearlers were dead against the white Australia uh, policy because it meant they couldn't employ these guys. Um, they would have to employ whites at higher wages. And what ended up happening was a lot of the Pearl Fleets, after the introduction of the white Australia policy, which was you know, several laws and acts, went off to Dutch New Guinea and started took, took their business away from Australia because they reckoned they couldn't, they couldn't make a living. But this is, uh, this is from the North Queensland Register, settling the aliens. So they, they were called aliens. Um, uh, and, and it was a big debate at the time. And, and this storm came, came along right at the height of the debate. So this is how the alien difficulty is solved. Um, it was, it was tongue-in-cheek. There was a great deal of sympathy, of course. But it's suggested here that, you know, this... This is the guys on the water. <clears throat> And since then, what I'm interested too is the way this story's been told over the years and it's been um, retold over and over and I'm interested in the way the story's changed a lot and a lot of the retelling has been wrong and, and overblown and, um, you know, schooner, Winetta, well, it was actually Crest of the Wave. Anyway, all this, it's just all wrong. Anyway, it's interesting the way that these stories are being told. This is um, Walter Roth, who was the pre protector of Aborigines at the time, um, and a really interesting man. His job was to enforce the Aboriginal Protection and Restriction of the Sale of Opium Act, which came into force in January 1898. And he was from a family of distinguished um, doctors and took the job as the protector of Aborigines. He wanted to be close to the Aborigines up there. He studied their languages and collected artefacts. He was an anthropologist. Um, and during his time in the north, he saw a lot of abuse, especially of um, what he called then were half-caste children, and he started developing his own ideas about removing these children from their parents and putting them into missions, which he... He was later employed by the West Australian government to look at the conditions of Aborigines in Western Australia. 
and he, this commission went on for quite a while and amongst his many recommendations, very few of which were adopted, was um, one of the few ones that was adopted was giving more power to protectors to remove children from their families and that was the start of the um, stolen generation. So it was Roth's uh, ideas, really, uh, that started the stolen generations. That was the only, one of the only recommendations from his inquiry that they adopted and it caused a rippling tragedy down through the ages. Roth went up and, uh, and, and to the site of the, of the um, hurricane. They called it a hurricane back then. And, uh, and drew this map and, and a very good description of what he saw. And he saw... You know, this is the way the trees had fallen. All this, all this landscape here had been scoured as if it had been burnt, he said. Everything was brown, dead. There were f he found remnants of canoes 70 to 80 feet up in trees. Um, they found porpoises on Flinders Island. You know, uh, well, well above 13 metres above the water, thrown up by the power of the sea which suggests that the storm, you know, produced a pretty decent uh, storm surge and wind. That's his report. Yeah. Fragments of native canoes located fully 70 or 80 feet above the high water level, which is what, you know... Um, People studying the Asian tsunami used as evidence for the heights of many of the, of, of the, the tsunami wave that came in, um, the height of the debris uh, above high water mark. So you know, 70 to 80 feet, which the wave action would have produced a great, you know, on top of the surge would have produced that sort of figure. That's um, Clement Ragg, one of the interesting um, historical figures employed by the Queensland government who predicted the storm or tried to. And as I said, you know, he started naming cyclones. He, start, he, he named them after he ran out of numbers. The letters in the Greek alphabet started with um, uh, South Seas maidens and then he went on to politicians, that particularly ones he didn't like. And there was a particular guy called Conroy who was the member for Werrell War. Um, this is, this is uh, after Federation. So, federal member for Wera War. And, uh, and so any bad storm that came along, you know, Rag would say, well, you know, better beware, you know, Conroy, black and treacherous, is <laughs> coming across. You know. In fact, I think I've got the, one of the quotes. That it, was, it was nicely done by the, uh, yeah, the immortal Conroy. Uh, <coughs> Ship's captains are counselled to beware for Conroy looking nasty is coming along the coast. Farmers' wives must not go to town today because Conroy, black and treacherous, is likely to cross the southern district. Sunday school children must postpone their picnic as Conroy in a wicked humour will be along in the afternoon. This is a bit of a take on, on um, what Rag was writing. But uh, he, they wouldn't give him the job as the <coughs> director of the Bureau of Meteorology, you know, the, the Commonwealth Bureau. So he got... Jack of them and ended off. Well, he ended up doing a lot of interesting things. He vanished from Brisbane. Uh, I think it was 190. I, I could be wrong. People know more about Rag than I do. But he vanished from Brisbane in about 1908, just vanished, and people thought he'd died. But he left a family, a lot of children and a wife. Everybody thought, thought he'd died. Then he turned up uh, years later in New Zealand with another wife. And, and I've seen... Uh, you know, accounts of Rag in Australia and Rag in New Zealand as if they're two different people, but it's the same person. And he and he did the same thing over there. He started predicting the weather, and he uh, was very eccentric. He, um, he 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 quite liked the idea of the Mormon religion. Um, he uh, he liked the idea of having lots of wives as well. So he. Uh, Right. 
So I won't keep you very long, but you can imagine these, so these big storms in the Coral Sea, um, uh, global warming, they're saying, will produce more powerful cyclones, the, the seas are warm, they'll probably come a bit further south. This is McIntosh Island on the Gold Coast, which is basically the centre of the Gold Coast. This is the, the Bureau of Meteorology, I've, I've actually taken these slides from, I should credit them. Um, McIntosh Island, now I think there's a road coming through here. A lot of expensive homes here. Well, that went completely underwater back in the 1950s, I think. Big storm came in, sort of a remnants of a cyclone. The Gold Coast is built on a river delta, of course, and, and, uh, and they were very lucky to escape the flooding that we had in Brisbane. But there's a disaster there waiting to happen, I'm told. So you know, that's McIntosh Island then. Underwater, they actually had to lift people out uh, from their dairy farms, and uh, that's McIntosh Island today. And you can imagine, uh, it hasn't really had a big flood since <laughs> then. So there's something like Mahina, even the remnants of it coming down the coast could have terrible consequences. <clears throat> this is Larry, which, you know, as I say, was nowhere near as strong as Mahina, but you can see that piece of timber thrust through the palm tree. This is Ivu. I was up in Mackay when Ivu struck. Category 5 at that time. This is Ada. You might remember Ada back in the 1970s. Destroyed um, Daydream Island. See, these are, these are cyclones that don't have anywhere near the intensity of Mahina. So just to give you some idea of the power of, of, of a really big storm. Oh, terrifying, yeah. Look, any storm is, and, um, and not to take away from Yasi at all, you know, a, a tragedy for anybody who is there. But the potential, I think, for some of these really big, severe storms. You know, you wouldn't want a Mahina hitting Cairns or Townsville. Um, interesting here that the tropical cyclones, you know, pre-75 and post-75. Oops, come back here. You can see you know, they're mostly up here. Pre-75, there are a lot of them are down here. So this is the, the, the seasons have changed. There's all sorts of. I'm not a meteorologist, but there are different, um, uh, you know, uh, decadal changes in some of these systems and the way they form and approach the coast. And you can see, though, having said that as well, the definition of the cyclone has changed. <laughs> so a lot of these cyclones up here probably wouldn't, would just be tropical lows. But there is a, a definite movement sort of south pre-75. And, you know, we're in a 74, 75 period at the moment of, you know, if you look at the weather systems, this is what the Mid Bureau is saying. That's why they're warning of a severe cyclone season coming up this year. These are just some of the, the bigger cyclones. You can see um, uh, Sigma is one of Roth, uh, one of um, Rags, Eli. Um, Rag used to say, uh, people used to say, why did you name your uh, cyclones after uh, young female women? And he said, well, why don't you name your daughters after my cyclones? And, and some people did. If, if you, you'll find in Townsville the occasional, especially middle name, Eli, Ada, Mahina, they, they, they appear in birth certificates around about the time of Rag. Rag was, uh, well, he was sort of quite a charming chap. <laughs> and he, uh, yeah. Yeah. There's, there, were, there were periods uh, you know, of time when they don't appear, and there's almost a 20-year cycle. If you if you have a look, at them, you know, you've got uh, 1899, 1918, then sort of the th around 30, 29, 30, then up in the 50s, then 74. It almost, it's almost a 20-year cycle for some of these big ones, the, the most notable ones. This, this is just a bit of an indication of the Southern Oscillation Index and the death toll and the and the big cyclones. So that's Mahina, SOI. They determine now. Or is 9.1 back then? Uh, what have we got here? Um, there's Yasi, 20. 
And now she hit the SOI. Now the other big ones were 1918. I mentioned John Martin Kenny, the policeman who went up to Mahina and um, he, he was camped on the ridge and the, you know, the cyclone produced a storm surge 40 feet. It's his 40 feet that stands as the record, even though that's second-hand information. He told somebody that and they reported that. But 40 feet was probably accurate. Um, he, was, he was on the ridge and his horses were swept away 40 feet above sea level. But he survived and got married. His wife died, married again. He ended up being killed by the next greatest cyclone to hit um, Queen or Australia, the 1918 Innisfail cyclone. And he was the superintendent then of the Hull River Mission, which from after which Mission Beach was named. So the Hull River Mission was at Mission Beach. It was a it was a new um, Aboriginal mission for for um, people, um, basically sent off their land further west, and they're all taken to Hull River. And he was a superintendent there. And the cyclone hit, and he uh, they was he, he and his family and children were sheltering in the house. I think his family were in the kitchen. In, uh, behind a big pot because the house was breaking up and he was in the house with his 13-year-old daughter and the house broke up and he decided to make a run for it, picked up his daughter and ran and they were both struck by a piece of timber and both killed at the same time. So Kenny survived the worst cyclone to be killed by the second worst. Wasn't there a much higher cyclone? There was, yeah, about a, a month uh, in January. So that, that, and that produced a storm surge of 28 feet. Um, I lived in Mackay for many, many, many years and had a house on the beach there and um, uh, or near the beach a few streets back. But the, uh, the storm surge would have come right over the top of the house um, if it had been there. So, you know, places like Mackay, also grave danger. So you can see the SOI in Mackay, 17.9 back in 1918, 30 people killed. Storm surge went all the way into the, I don't know whether you know Mackay, all the way into the showgrounds. It's a big storm. Oh, they do. They've taken account. Yeah, they have. But over the years, I suppose they haven't. They, they are now. It's been a lot of, <laughs> lot of effort. <laughs> a lot of effort. Well, we've had a fairly quiet time, you know. Um, when was the last big... Really big, oh, it's been obviously RC, Larry, um, Rinderford, yeah, the, the Townsville Cyclones, um, Althea. But there's been, a, there's been a long time when we haven't really had a big impact on a major city, on a major city. So Althea, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Oh look, I don't, I don't, I, I, I just, I just was interested in the SOI here and the relationship with the death toll. But of course now too, we're, our planning regulations are much better. Um, and houses, you'll notice Yasi when it hit, the houses were still standing. A lot of them lost their roofs, but even those older, you know, houses that were, they had cyclone bolts through them. They were much better prepared than we would have been a hundred years ago. So the houses are pretty good, and that's why you get with a Yasi a death toll. Well, one, but that was almost unrelated to the cyclone. It was an asphyxiation. Yeah. yeah. Right, yep. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, we haven't had a cyclone come down that far. We used to have it a lot, and you'll you'll hear. You know, the Gold Coast was renowned for. It was actually hit by a cyclone from behind once. Mind you, that was a slightly different definition of a cyclone, but it was a Category One, and it had come down from the Gulf, and it done a lot of damage in Charleville on the way down, and it hit the Gold Coast from behind as a Category 1. Um, but we haven't seen a lot of those. We see a lot of uh, winter lows do some damage in the north. Why do you still feel that from the south? The water's cooler. 
The, the, the cyclones can't be sustained um, with a water temperature below, I think it's 28. Farmers in North America, not, they very commonly go up to North America. Yeah, they do. You've got the Gulf Stream, I think, just keeps the water a lot warmer. But you've got a lot of cool currents coming up the coast. So the currents here come from the south coming up. They can and go to latitude 45. Yeah. yeah, they can. That's right. Now, you won't get a hurricane normally come down this far, but they used to. Hmm. Well, let them, yeah, I, I suppose they're predictions, so maybe maybe we'll see more of it. But they certainly used to, before 74, you'll see a lot of strikes uh, around the Gold Coast and even northern New South Wales. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was a one-off Perth, wasn't it? That's right. I think the, then again, the currents can probably sustain it. I'm not quite sure. I haven't seen the current. I'm not a meteorologist or a scientist, but I suspect that the warmer water pools come a bit further down there. So the cyclone needs the energy. It's the cyclone just feeds off the warmth of the sea. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 So. Sorry? Oh, just ask a question. I'd say, yeah. <laughs> ask a question when you like. No. <laughs> No, look, just yeah. ask a question if you, if you want to know something. Well, I, I'm just wondering about the Japan Yen. Yeah. Yeah, that, that figure that uh, the Asian Union rather than the Euro Area reminds me of the pressure. Isn't oh, it? the central pressure of the cyclone, yeah. yeah. Well, what is considered normal or safe? What is, what is that relative to? Um, is it high? Oh, it's, it's high and low pressures. You'll see it all the time when you look at the weather maps. You'll see a high pressure system. Yeah. Okay, so and a low pressure system. Up, up north. Um, what's, the, what's the normal range? Oh, um, a normal range? Oh, well, I don't know. Probably uh, a high pressure system might be 1,020 mm-hmm. hectopascals, and a low pressure system might be. It c- it's just relative in some way. So a low pressure system could be 1,002 or 3 if it's you know, a high pressure system. It's just there's an area of high pressure and an area of low pressure, but it's comparative. <laughs> A cyclone has to. There's, there's a certain so definition. Of, no, not really. It's <laughs> it just it's, 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 it's just. I don't think there is a really an average pressure. Maybe if, if you looked at a particular area, you'll see that the average pressure for this particular time of the day might be 1,021 hectopascals. The ship's captains in Bathurst Bay. What what happens normally is in the morning. They will read the barometer and it might say 1,021 hectopascals, or it would have said inches then, but 1,021 hectopascals today. They would have expected that to rise a bit um, later in the morning. If it didn't rise and it went down, they knew something was wrong. So if it went down instead of up, even a little bit, they knew, uh uh-oh, there's trouble coming. So it's it's the comparison. It's not really the pressure itself doesn't mean that much. It's more the comparative pressures. The, the winds flow from areas of high pressure to low pressure. And in the Gulf, you can sort of sense it in around the wind direction and the, the shape of the current. You can tell. Yeah. You can tell the current starts. That one goes in. Yes. And you, you kind of work, and you can work out from the direction where the, that direction went. It's set up. That's right. And the hornet's tail starts going around. Well, that's a bad sign, isn't it? When they're up 13 metres, you're in deep and serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's right, and they used a lot of observations back then, not just their barometers. But they had... We had a little little spot found in June one year. What did we use? We predicted that on Lucas Island. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A neighbour said the crabs climb up trees. Oh. <laughs> These are some of the. How long are we going for time? Oh, we're, we're a bit over. A bit over. Oh, well, look, I'll leave it there. That's all right. Well, this is some of the characters. Just yeah. quickly, characters. You know, we've got um, John Douglas, the resident on Thursday Island, the last of the Victorian gentlemen. Um, Mara Lifu, who has actually won a uh, um, Queensland Government uh, medal for bravery during the cyclone by uh, rescuing her sisters, some of the divers, Kenny, uh, Maggie Porter. William Field Porter, and uh, you know, some of the interesting um, research uh, that sort of gives you an idea of 
of how people spoke in those days. People swear, swore in those days exactly the way we swore, swear now. We think that we're... But what happened was you couldn't... Well, you weren't allowed to swear in court. Even if, so what would happen? The guy, the, the pearlers would be drunk and disorderly down the street. OK, they get drunk. The policeman would arrest them and then they'd be done for obscene language because they'd swear at the policeman. So they'd be taken off to court. John Douglas would be the magistrate... <laughs> But they weren't allowed to swear in court, so the cops couldn't actually say what the man said. They actually had to paste it, this little attachment. They pinned it to the bottom of the charge sheet. Um, uh, you uh, effing Irish bastard, you effing... Uh, if, you, if, you, if you lock me up, I'll tell Mr James Clark, who was the pearling king at the time, who was obviously his employer and couldn't do without this guy. So then he was... So he's, as soon as he said that, the cop took it down... Right, you're, right. You're, you're being done for indecent language, and it appeared. Uh, well, no, it's pretty, it's pretty eloquent, isn't it? Really, <laughs> picked it up quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So there we go. Yep. The Devil's Eye. Yeah, it's a novel based on the. It's a novel based on this uh, story about the cyclone. Yeah. Uh, well, the Devil's Eye is the uh, hurricane. Uh, hu- hurricane is the uh, South American god yeah. of of, um, so of storms. Can, can Gary actually uh, well, I can't say if you haven't read the book. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that hanging as the punchline. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, they had to. Well, they had to rebuild all their luggers, and they used a new design after that. So the design of luggers changed. There was a, a lugger went down called the Zephyr, which is I'd really like to find. It's apparently still around today. Um, it went down. They they salvaged it. They salvaged a few of the luggers, and used it. And it's still about, which is a remarkable thing. Well, can you all join me in thanking Ian? It's been a month is our last out of the port for the year, which it's a number of presentations on Queensland's World War II sites in Queensland, based on a lot of the research that was done for the Department of Public, uh, the big website that was done um, uh, World War II places by the Department of Public Works. So there'll be three historians talking about um, uh, talking about Queensland sites, so it's a, a sort of more heritage specific talk um, and I think it's called Tripping Over Concrete or something. Um, so I hope you, you can come um, to that next month. This, uh, this session's been recorded um, and it will be available on our website as a, web, as a podcast um, in the next week or so. So please, if you've enjoyed it, uh, tell people or go back and, and look for it. So thanks again and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Thank you.